I mean, he's just a reasonable guy. You just need reasonable people in Congress. You can't do people who just want to be famous. Uh, the Michael, uh, the Matt Gates of the world, the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world. They just want to be famous and be close to uh, famous people like Donald Trump. I think they're terrible. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. Brian Kilmeade is a dynamic force in broadcasting, known for co-hosting Fox and Friends and hosting both One Nation and The Brian Kilmeade Show. Brian brings his sharp wit, deep knowledge, and engaging storytelling to our podcast. From delving into political history to his insightful commentary on current events, Brian's diverse expertise guarantees a conversation that's as enlightening as it is entertaining. Get ready to dive into the mind of a man who shapes opinions and captures imaginations. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. First of all, Brian, I want to thank you so much for making time to do this podcast. You must be one of the hardest working celebrities in the world. Fox and Friends, your radio show, One Nation on Saturday night, and you're a best-selling author. I know you, like me, are always working on the next book, so thank you for your time. No, oh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I'm honored to be asked. Yeah, we were excited. You were, you were one of the first names that came up when we were talking about doing this. Excellent. Brian, being so public about your opinions has turned you into a polarizing figure in the media world. I want to ask you a few questions to try to peel back the onion for the people that don't know you as well as I do. Sure. I know you as a, a friend, a husband, a father, a writer, and even a youth soccer coach. Meanwhile, you can't walk down the street without being recognized by the public. For the people who don't know you the way I do, how much is the youth soccer coach like the celebrity people see on TV? Uh, no, it's the same. I'm, I'm the same as uh, when I was coaching soccer, when I was coaching all the kids, when I was playing, um, you know, doing sports. Uh, if you don't like me on TV, you're not going to like me uh, in the bar. <laughs> you're not going to like me on the field. I'm just the same person. And I, I don't, it, I when I walk down the street, there, there's not a huge uh, uproar. There's people that know you. For the most people, it's very supportive. Uh, it's a very interesting time now because now uh, the people that love Trump, uh, if you say anything about Trump, like, hey, you know, Bird calling uh, another candidate Bird Brain, not a good idea, they get offended. If you don't speak up against Trump, they get offended. Um, if you speak, if you say anything about Nikki Haley, Nikki Haley's camp gets offended. I've, I've never, DeSantis people say they weren't given a fair shot. I have never seen more complainers in my life. So those are the candidates, let alone their followers. It is much like sports now. In the beginning, it would be like, yeah, you know, yeah, let's just see if Kerry is going to be able to beat Bush. You know, let, let's see if uh, Al Gore is going to be able to beat Bush. And let's see if Romney's got a shot against Obama. And people get heated, but OK, it's over. Not now. You know, I don't know how much that's to do with Trump or just these times. Now you, you can't, you know, you sit in that seat. They don't want to hear anything negative, negative about their candidate. Do you think it's a, a social media thing or do you think it's just these two particular candidates? 
Um, well, we'll see. And when we get to the post-Trump wall, world, it'll be four years or in nine months. Well, we'll see. But my feeling is, I think the parties are so different. I mean, if you look at the border, you look at the car you drive. I mean, you have one party is like, you know what? No more gas stoves. Really? Uh, yeah, the gas cars, you can't buy new ones in Los Angeles and uh, and Massachusetts soon. Okay. Um, you're going to really be a, uh, be able to open up the border, wide open the border. Is that what you think? Okay. It's not like I want to open up the border a little. I want to do, I want to start laying out solar panels. This seems to be such a dramatic difference with the agenda. That's why people think there's a lot at stake. Um, and then schools, you look at the curriculum in schools, people say, okay, I'm not just talking about my school district. If one guy is president or a woman, and if another one is president, it's even going to, it's going to trickle down to the curriculum in schools and what the kids read. It's going to trickle down to how many illegal immigrants come into your classrooms. It's going to trickle down to how tough you are on crime. Are you going to have a heart for the criminal? And watch them repeatedly commit crimes, or are you going to uh, crack down too hard and take off the other side? So, to me, there seems to be a very a lot of difference between the parties, which ups the stakes come election time. You have been outspoken about President Trump's election denial. That attitude is a threat to democracy. If Trump wins the nomination and we have another close election. Are you worried about that happening again? Well, number one, it's it's like this. It's it's very similar to sports. If you go to into Candlestick Park when you were playing, and you don't have the right cleats, and you don't expect the fans to be intimidated, uh, you know, if you don't want, you just don't think they're going to manipulate the field to make their home team try to be successful, then you haven't been, you're not prepared to win. Both sides know the districts they got to win. Both sides know the integrity issues from the last two elections. Both sides got millions of dollars to straighten it out through the electoral process, through election reforms, and through observers. If it's Philadelphia, observers. If it's in Atlanta, these are the problems. They know all the problems. So these results, that they know the states are going to be slow. They know the district's going to be slow. If they have not done their homework to ensure that these districts and these counties and these states report a fair and accurate election, that's as much a part of the process as the final score and and not being prepared to win. you got to wear long cleats if it's going to be muddy grass. And if you show up in turf shoes, don't blame the field. You didn't make the adjustment. So all of them, you got all this money. Don't expect me to go find out what happened in, in Minneapolis. I can't go out there. We don't have reporters for all these controversial districts. You got to depend on people to do their job and the millions they collect. You put people in place to observe their job. And I think that we went through the worst. And I think for now on, people are going to have to think twice before they do what Hillary Clinton said. You know, for four years, Hillary Clinton said Donald knows he wasn't legitimately elected. Really? He thought so? I don't know. I thought that was said. Oh, the Russians did. They do a two-year investigation. And they said, OK, they don't admit that he was legitimately elected until 2020 when Trump went out in the limb and said, I don't think that le le election was legitimate without any reason. Nothing stood up to the test. There were irregularities, but nothing. He couldn't prove anything. And then I thought he went way too far. But I don't think he led an insurrection. But I thought how you lose has a lot to do with the person you are. It's easy to win. But how you lose defines who you are. And I don't think he's a good loser, obviously, the most biggest understatement ever. Having said all that, it, elections are going to be tight from here on in. So I think people got to go out of their way. There'll be a window. And when you look at that window and these election results come in, you have your moment, you got your lawyers, make sure the results are fair, and then you shake hands. And I'm just Tim, as you know, and Troy, as you know, this is not the first time there were problems with the elections. Remember, John Adams didn't stick around for Thomas Jefferson. Uh, remember, John Quincy Adams just left the White House unsecured when uh, when Andrew Jackson won. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot. There's been a lot of sore losers out there. 
and some of them are considered our, our really strong presidents. Uh, but I just think that um, Al Gore deserves credit. And I think that Mitt Romney deserves credit. You know, I, I just think when, uh, you know, you, you work hard. I mean, if I wasn't around in the 60s, but it must have broken uh, Nixon's heart knowing that he probably won that election by all reports. There was something manipulated in Illinois that flipped the election to JFK. But he said, what's better for the country now is not a big controversy. Uh, I'll see you down the line. And he ended up winning back in the, in the late 60s. So I, I worry you, about it, but you got to do your homework. You don't think, so do you think Trump would, do you think Trump kind of learned his lesson in the sense of if he were to lose a close election, do you think this time around he would kind of shake his hand and move on? Or do you think it, well, he would double? Troy, I don't think he would have the support to pull something like this again. Um, because you think about it, he has good people around him. All those people said, you know, the pandemic's bizarre, what was done with these delayed elections, these write-ins is interesting, but there's nothing here that I could see is wrong. William Barr, all the attorneys he had in the White House counsel. So we went and got fringe attorneys to agree with him. Those attorneys have now basically lost their licenses, been put in jail, overcharged, been ruined, Rudy Giuliani included. So you got to ask yourselves, who would ever do that again? And number two, who would ever lose their license and their livelihood for a guy that's win or lose? This is it. So I don't see it being a problem. If you have a fair, free and fair election, and I think we got to read everything possible. I'll send you something afterwards that shows that Mark Elias is already working the refs a little bit in a way that uh, breaches on irregularity or illegality. So I don't see anything like that happening again. I think everyone's really attuned to it. I think networks have been sued because of it. Uh, it's and especially when it's unsubstantiated. Can you touch on that? What do you mean when you say he's, he's kind of already tipping the scale a little bit? Well, I'm going to send you a couple of articles where Mark Elias is doing some things in different districts. You got to keep an eye on this guy. He's um, the, you know, the right has their, uh, their scoundrels, but this guy, Mark Elias is just evil. Just keep an eye on what he's been up to. He also, when he lost the election in 2016, he's the one who really launched the whole fake Russia investigation, which has not been fully unwound yet. And then they later go, yeah, you legitimately won, but, um, but now you lost. They admitted in 2020, he won in 2016, after basically making his first two and a half years nonstop, uh, nonstop challenges of the phony Russian uh, allegations and revelations that never panned out. Yeah, I, I remember the night that uh, Trump got elected, he gave a speech where he was talking about kind of bringing people together now that the, now the election is over. And I was, I was hopeful at that point because it seems like as a country, what we need more than anything is to kind of be brought back together. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But the thing is, too, is like you and I are, are made up a little differently. So with, with Trump, he's, he does not turn around from any fight. And they, and they actually fought him every step of the way. They gave him one day of a honeymoon. And within two days, Washington Post publishes the story, let the impeachment inquiry begin. And then within 10 days, James Comey saying, we got this dossier. It makes you look pretty bad. I, I don't really know if the Russians have played a big role in this election, but I'm going to launch an investigation, but it's just not going to be on you. We're going to look into your family. And think about that. From those days on, you got a guy made up as we all know Trump. You're going to fight me. I'm going to fight you. And they make up an election integrity problem and they go after him and harass him, launch a special prosecution. They almost put his son-in-law in jail. They deposed his son twice, two or three times. Whatever you want to say about Trump, he's an excellent dad. Uh, his kids are fantastic. I've seen him on and off camera. They launched this investigation. They get to his Achilles heel, which is that's watching his kids harassed, who, by the way, are basically volunteering. The other ones are in private sector, Ivanka, too. So from day one, so he's trying to get things done. Maybe he's a divisive person by nature. I'm not sure. But from day one, they're questioning whether he belongs there or not. Then they take his national security advisor out and Michael Flynn. And then they, they flip his attorney general and convince him that he's compromised because he met with the Russian ambassador. So they have him step aside and bring in this lawyer from the outside to do a, uh, a wild, uh, unwieldy, unlimited investigation into his life. 
while pers- while flipping his attorney, by the way, two weeks later, because of some allegation of paying off a stripper that we're still in the middle of right now. And this is a sitting president. Suddenly, we've got to get to the bottom of something that happened in 1994. So if you think about that type of attack on top of the type of personality we all know Donald Trump is, it's the perfect uh, explosive mix. So if he wanted to bring the country together, how can you do that when people are questioning whether he even belongs there? Obviously, you have been a strong supporter of the Republican Party for a long time. What are a couple of things that you think the party needs to improve on? This could be a specific policy or an issue. Uh, they haven't made any uh, legitimate attempt at the black community. They have a really good message. Uh, treat everyone equally. Uh, give people equal opportunity, not equal outcomes. What are the problems in the inner city? Why do you feel in some cases that you're stuck? Uh, they come out and they talk about cutting government spending and they allow it to be translated into let's cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Let's cut out welfare and unemployment. When if you talk to Tim Scott, if you talk to any of these economists, uh, a lot of the economists that end up working for Treasury with Republicans end up being mostly Democrats. If you talk to anyone in the free market, nobody is saying that. But they allow their message to be still down to a party for a while. They're doing better on it now that doesn't care about the cities because they don't think they can win the cities. And a lot of the cities are where African-Americans are located, which is 17 percent of the population. So go in there with your messages. You're not prejudiced. All you want to do is give people an equal opportunity. And what they do is they have consultants probably come in and say, if you're going to win this state, it's going to be in the suburbs. You know, if you're going to win this state, it's going to be in the rural community. We're not going to be able to win the cities. So what happens is you got a finite amount of time and money. They make no effort. Then you talk to the black community, it goes, no one's even trying to win my vote on the Republican side. So I'll be loyal to the people that show up all the time. But now they're being totally taken for granted. And now it looks like Trump's got 20 percent of the black vote. Put it this way. Whatever you think of Donald Trump, uh, Mitt Romney had eight, eight percent. So right now he's got 20 percent of the black vote by just putting forward his policies and his personality. Can you imagine if they went in there not to give away money, but to find out what the problem is and how you can help? Now, Donald Trump uh, came out and he said it's a war zone in Chicago. I like to send to the National Guard and give these people a, a sense of peace and security for the first time. And they said, that's typical of this white guy. He wants to send in troops to straighten out a black community. He allowed that message to get changed. When I know what perfectly the approach was, what they wanted to do is you're these people that want to make a living and have to worry about their kids and their cars being stolen and their kids being knocked off, uh, being robbed and worry about the security in the schools. It's impossible to get their life on track. So let's provide at least the security. So, it's like the Republicans just get lazy when it comes to uh, uh, inner cities. I mean, you see it right now. We have Lawrence Jones going to uh, Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia. Uh, he'll be end up in New York just talking to the people in the cities. You know what they're upset about? Not black or white or Donald Trump or uh, a little bit of Joe Biden. These illegal immigrants have taken over their shelters, have taken over their schools because they put them into working class communities not upper class communities. You don't stick them in, you know, you don't stick them in up, upper, uh, the Upper East Side. You stick them in Harlem. You know, you don't, you don't stick them in uh, beautiful Brook, uh, Brookville, Long Island. You stick them in Brentwood. And you take these illegal immigrants and all of a sudden these kids who are already working class run down schools have other kids from other countries getting better attention and more services than them. And while they're so upset at their lawmakers, there's no Republican knocking on the door saying... I feel your pain, man. Let me try to fix this for you. I'm trying. That's why I'm trying to seal the border. So that's a major weakness. And I, I don't think I'm really pro Republican. I'm pro American. And it really bothers me when people run down the history of the country and don't feel appreciative of what they have. Doesn't mean you don't want to make the country better. But I feel like the Democratic Party has emerged in many cases as anti-American. And that that's what bothers me. Do you think it's truly the Democratic Party or do you think it's the kind of social media amplifying the, the you know, five or 10 percent at the end, the more it's like a far left and far right are kind of being heard now and less people that are more down the center or pro-American, as you said. Well, I, I'll put it this way. What I, what I just said is not really different from what Bill Maher has been saying, uh, yeah. what Joe Rogan's been saying. 
And Joe Rogan's like, just said yesterday, I am now, I'm more left than right, but they have gone insane in California. Uh, they've gone basically communist. You know, you can't say the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, you know, we're supposed to, you're supposed to ignore the homeless. You're supposed to pretend as if doubling your taxes is okay. That, ta- that gas, $6 a gallon is all right because it's good for the environment. It, to me, that's, that's where the people in power, Governor Prisker in, in Illinois, Governor, uh, the governor of Massachusetts, whose name eludes me, my apologies, Governor Gavin Newsom. I mean, if you're going to make them the leader of your party, I got to listen to what they're saying. And that's what they're doing. You know, I look at Bill Maher and I'm like, or Harold Ford on our channel. Harold Ford was running for president. I'd vote for him today. He's unabashedly American. He's center right. If Joe Manchin runs for president, I'd have a hard time not voting for Joe Manchin. Uh, he's a great guy. He's center left. Actually, he seems to be more center right sometimes, center left. Uh, from West Virginia, um, used to run a state, knows how to balance a budget, knows business. He's going to be in the mix there. So those people, I don't care what you believe. Just for, Can we at least agree on one thing? The foundation of the country, the country's history, and that we're pretty lucky to be here. On our worst day, it's better than any other country's best day. And not only don't people appreciate it, they're against it. Let's talk a little more about Joe Manchin. I know you recently interviewed him on your show about this exact situation. If Senator Manchin did end up running, that would create a really interesting scenario. I believe he would pull votes from both Biden and Trump. Tim, you're 100 percent right. And and that's who Joe Manchin. I was so I'm at the Jaguars game. Right. We have a I got this house in Ponte Vedra and we were at the Jaguars game and I get word that he's there. So. He ends up spending an hour with uh, my family and me. We're watching the game. And then Michael Waltz was there. You've probably seen him on panel. Green Ray. Uh, For our country for 22 years or whatever. Been in war zones constantly. And I'm watching these two just talk about legislation. Four or five politicians in the country. They're already making progress together right in front of me. Talking about these are this is our soft spot. This is where we're going to look to give on immigration, on, di- on different things, on getting Ukraine aid. Uh, so, I mean, he's just a reasonable guy. You just need reasonable people in Congress. You can't do people who just want to be famous. Uh, the Michael, uh, the Matt Gates of the world, the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world. They just want to be famous and be close to uh, famous people like Donald Trump. I think they're terrible. I mean, whenever you think of Lindsey Graham, the guy has no interest in publicity. He's interested in getting his point across. Michael Walsh the same way. Tom Cotton is phenomenal. Uh, as I mentioned, Joe Manchin. They're not looking to be famous. They're looking to make an impact. I think that's what you should be, uh, that's what you should be doing. He said, Tim, this is how right you are. He said, I'm trying to convince Mitt Romney to run with me. And Mitt says, I'm probably the most unpopular politician in the country. And you don't want me. I'm too old. I'm 76. And he's like, no, we could do it. And I'm, and he goes, and I'll stop you there. Joe, Joe Manchin said, I think I'm the most unpopular politician in the country because <laughs> they're both, you know, evidently on some level, they're disliked and disappointed on both sides. Well, I got two, two follow-ups from that, Brian. One, what do you think about <laughs> Joe Manchin kind of, you know, announcing he's not going to run again? Do you think that's a good thing? Kind of having, I guess, like an informal, almost like a term limit. Because I'm I'm pretty pro term limits on all political any kind of political uh, role. Yeah, I mean, Joe Manchin was not term limited though. This is what I think. Uh, Jim Justice, who is um, Tim, you, you would appreciate this. He is Bill Pill Parcells. He talks like him. I mean, Parcells had a weight, a little bit of a weight problem. Jim Justice has a weight problem. Uh, also, Jim Justice wildly successful, unbelievably successful, uh, and a nice man, by the way. So Jim Justice, when he was going to run, Manchin knew he was going to lose. And he always takes pride in never losing an election. He's 74. He's like, why would I want to do this? So why would I want to go through then battle it out, grind it out there? So to me, it made sense that he wasn't going to run. But I think it had a lot to do with Jim Justice getting in the race. Oh, that's interesting. But what do you, what do you think about, in general, term limits? I mean, about, you know, I guess in all, Congress, Senate, sure. all, all. I mean, do I think, you know, let's say three terms, four terms. Like, I think that it takes, like, it takes a year or two to understand how to work. So, if, and all of a sudden within, with the horrible thing about the house, all they do is raise money and they're not being selfish. They're doing it to survive. 
So the minute they get in, they got to start raising, raising money for the next election. So I would think three terms in the House. I would love to see that. And maybe two or three, two, two, maybe three in the Senate would be great. I mean, why is Chuck Schumer still there? I mean, Chuck Schumer's not even standing up for New York Jewish community. He's, he's trying to get Zinn, which is a nicotine patch, uh, illegal. But he doesn't even try to help his own religion in the New York City where anti-Semitism is running rampant. To me, that's why you become a politician to make a difference. So Chuck Schumer should be out of there. He's going to be, he's waiting to be majority leader. He's majority leader again. He's going to stick around for another 15, 20 years. Why not give somebody else a shot? So that would be great. I told Troy when we were talking about having you on uh, that you're at the crossroads of history. I and many others on both sides believe that this is going to be a turning point in America. Every election people say it, but this one just feels too important. I think this will even be a turning point in world history. Do you think that's true? Um, I don't think it's not true. I think it's, it's always a chance of that because you don't know what challenges are going to pop up. But from the challenges, what we can z visualize, how the Middle East is on fire, how the Russians seem to be uh, trying to expand, how China is the only reason China is kind of tame right now because their economy is sucking wind. All those things could explode. But um, democracy is not at stake. I mean, I, I, for to think that Trump is going to get rid of democracy and become a dictatorship is crazy. Uh, to think that Joe Biden's capable of going another four years, you'd have to defy your, you have to, uh, you'd have to not be seeing what where what the average American's got to admit to seeing. I mean, I can't believe that his wife's even going to let him run. So something's going to happen um, if Trump wins. I, I think I, I thought he, he was pretty much on the money. He's not going to sit there and weaponize his Justice Department. He's going to make sure his Justice Department doesn't turn on him. He's going to make the FBI doesn't turn on him. He's going to make sure the CIA doesn't turn on him. And dare I say, work towards our best interests. But you have nothing to fear with democracy with Trump. There's no way when people come out and say he's not going to leave if he loses. That's that's a farce. But I do think that uh for the most part, Joe Biden has brought this country in a terrible direction. He's made us look weak in every corner of the world. He's in the middle of another crisis. Uh, the one thing you'll learn from, from reading back in history, especially Thomas Jefferson and Tripoli Pirates and read his words, the only thing that people understand, uh, these brutal, especially in, in the Middle East, understand is strength and power. When you show them reason, they, they read it as weakness. We've seen it over and over again. And I can't imagine somebody showing more weakness and us paying more of a price like those three families and the one of which I talked to today who lost uh, uh, their daughter while she was sleeping in Jordan. I mean, I'm not saying he's directly responsible, but our posture of weakness, that's what I think is at jeopardy. If we continue with this, people say we got four years to make a move. We'll never have somebody this inept and this overmatched. We got to move on America and their interests. But. But people are worried about Trump. I, I would. I feel just the opposite. Um, I think he's going knows exactly who he's going to put in. He's got a lot of sane people around him: Robert O'Brien, uh, John Radcliffe. Definitely going. Uh, definitely going back. He's got uh, people that want to work for him. Um, he's got a whole lineup. The Heritage Foundation has has done interviews for him if they want to take it to the smallest job to the biggest job. So he could actually hit the ground running and start with confirmations right away. So I think the saying democracy is on the line is because President Biden, in my opinion, has nothing to run on. And it panics people. When you say Donald Trump is Hitler, and then if Donald Trump wins and people believe what you say, that puts the country in danger. Nobody thinks Joe Biden's Hitler. They just think that he's done a terrible job. Many people think he's done a terrible job as president, but I don't think he is evil. I don't think Barack Obama is evil. I don't think Bill Clinton is evil. So I think it's dangerous when you make Mitt Romney a white supremacist and now you're going to make Donald Trump Hitler. So I just say, if, I know negative advertising is part of the landscape, but I, I wish people would be somewhat responsible. Yeah, I think I think too, Brian. To your point, like a, a, a big splintering factor, it seems like in the Republican Party right now is even even not necessarily the Republican Party, but the kind of pro-American people like 
like yourself, like a Tucker Carlson. I know a lot of people are against, you know, supporting Ukraine, against um, supporting Israel, not financially, but with soldiers and with weapons. You know, what do you think? Where do you, where do you lie on that issue? And, and, you know, what do you think the right answer is there? Oh, the right answer is very simple. You give Ukraine what they need to be successful. And uh, the delay is absolutely sickening uh, on the Republican side. I don't recognize that side. I mean, I'm Tucker. I'm great friends with Tucker. I think I am. But I could not disagree more about his stance. J.D. Vance, my number one, my number one focus is to make sure the Ukraine war is not financed. Are you insane? You have one country absorbing another with designs on every Baltic nation, many of which are NATO, which will bring war. And one country fighting gallantly, brilliantly, but despite the long odds, all they want is weapons. And this president slow walks the weapon system he originally denies them, still has not given them the F-16s or produced the pilots they promised to train a year ago. And now, because there's been no uh, leg uh, legitimate accounting on our money, Republicans who are critical of the of the war anyway have something to run with and said, guys, we're missing billions of dollars. Where did it go? And they say, we're not really sure. Or they say, well, a lot of them pay for the pensions and salaries of the people of Ukraine. Well, that's not going to fly with the American people when we're 36 trillion in debt. But if you give people weapons to fight for their freedom and push back our enemy, there is no counter argument. But the problem is, Troy and Tim, is that the president never makes the argument. He's depending on Lindsey Graham, General Jack Keane, Mike Waltz to make the argument. And they're sick of it because they're fighting with their own party about the mission that Democrats are running. And now they just and they want it supported. And I think they should. But they don't want to explain it. So Republicans are taking the hits from Republicans for trying to rationalize Joe Biden's uh, support of Ukraine, which just give them the weapons they need and they'll be successful. And I know you feel the same way about Israel. Speaking of Israel, my Christian faith has had a profound impact on my life. I know you're Catholic. What, if any, impact has your faith had on your life? Um... I mean, it's all, all positive. You have the foundations of morals and doing the right thing. The one thing I find at Fox, there's so, there, there are so many religious people here. And I guess it's because a lot of them are from the South, especially Ainsley that I work with. And anybody who thinks that, you know, if you think you understand the Bible and you think that you're religious, it pales in comparison to most of the people I'm around, uh, including Sean Hannity. I was shocked how religious Sean Hannity is. So I don't pretend to be a biblical scholar. I just try to live the best possible uh, way. Um, I love going to, I've got really good friends with Cardinal Dolan, which is hard not to be friends with him. And if there were more people like that, I think I'd be going to church more. But I think I have a, I have a good foundation, but I, I don't think that, um, I, I don't think that I'm the, the most fervent Catholic hitting on all cylinders. You worked your way up in this business. Nobody gave you anything. Is there a turning point in your career where you said to yourself, nothing can stop me now? No, I, I, don't, like, I don't even take it for granted. I was even talking to Dawn over the weekend. You know, I don't know what's happening to the, our business. You know, this podcast is, is, is big. Uh, podcasts are big. But if you look at the business, how it's changing, you know, it used to be when we were coming up, we're the same age, just about. When we're coming up, it's like, okay, you try to get a local job, right? And if you have to, you can go to cable. There's some news emerging in cable. We'll see what will happen. You know, CNN is there, but nobody watches CNN. And then you try to work your way up, whether it's sports or news. And then you try to get yourself to the network. And then as we're coming up, cable gets big. And opportunities start coming. And then it was just get reps. I don't care if they're paying you $20,000 a year. Just you need reps. You got to get out there. I got it. So then you work your way up. And then by the time I get to Fox, I go, okay, the next logical step would be a network. Sometime in the middle of Fox, it became pretty clear that I don't really want to go anywhere else because I think Fox is as important uh, and these news networks are important as any network. And plus, I'm looking at what they have to do. It's so commercialized, you don't get a chance to really talk. And I have more time and more of a format. And now I'm looking at something where half the world, Troy, probably most of your friends, don't. I don't know if they have cable. Uh, I know my daughters who are in their 20s, they say, you know, no one has cable that had cable at college. So they're watching on their phones instead of watching, just watching shows on their phones. They're watching Instagram and TikTok videos. So 
I could never, ever be content and think I've arrived. But I remember at one point, I was always that person say, hey, what do you think of what I did? What can I do better? And at one point, if you keep asking people what you could do better, they will tell you. And after a while, it starts hurting your confidence. So I, after a while, I just, I shut it off. And I said, let me start being my own judge. I'm not going to be perfect, but I don't need people who think they can coach me because it started getting overcoached. So I remember just at one point going, okay, uh, the jury's out. And this is what I can do. And let's see, see how far I can go. And I got very well, lucky hooking up with Fox and seeing that this was like joining the Yankees when they were the Highlanders. If they walked in, I imagine if young players walked into Yankee Stadium being shelled out and built out and as he's screwing the seats in, they might be like, you know what? Nobody knows who the Highlanders are, but who's ever playing in this stadium is going to matter. And that's why when I watch this place being built and they're just taking one room after another, after another, one floor after another, I go, man, I'm just going to try to hold on here. And I went from wanting to be the sports guy uh, and do sports for news. Then I realized I'd rather do news. And good thing, because if I was a sports guy, I wouldn't have a job. Do you think when you stopped taking the coaching that that was kind of a, a in your career? I know you're you're kind of known or self-proclaimed and known as an endurance guy, not as a big kind of flash in the pan. You just kind of put, get 1% better every day. But is that, would you, if you had to say kind of a turning point, would you say right. when you stopped uh, taking outside criticism, just kind of focused on you? Yeah, I mean, not that I didn't take any. I wasn't soliciting it anymore. I was like, okay, listen, now I'm thinking way too much. Uh, and then I realized once you have the fundamentals down, then you got to build your own style. And some people are critical of your style and they'll say, I'm like, you know what? I might not be right for you. This is kind of the way I do it. But so I'll prepare for every interview. I know the standups. I'll, I'll try to make everything conversational. Um, be ready to uh, follow up on questions because I have the research down. But I'm sure there's a lot of people who think that I could do more. And a lot of people watch me every day and go, I can't believe he's still had this job. But I just realized after a while, that's totally the nature of this position. I mean, especially if you guys watch those games on Sunday. I mean, how many people have commented on the sports casting? Uh, I like this guy in color. I hate this guy in color. This person on the sidelines is useless. Okay. They're still at the top of the game covering the top uh, sport and the games that matter most in front of 50 million people. And yet they right. still have millions of critics who are sitting at home are sure they're better than you. And they might be <laughs> right or not right. So you just got to, after a while, realize that's always going to happen. All you can do yeah. is do your best and not everyone's going to like you. You've interviewed so many amazing people in your career. Was there anyone in particular that stands out as your personal favorite? Um, I remember I, I loved interviewing George Foreman. I thought he was, uh, I, the first time I interviewed him, I thought it was pretty amazing. My first big interview ever was uh, right out of college interviewing Joe Frazier, which was almost surreal because you know, you grow up watching that guy, Muhammad Ali, and we're right at the same age. So boxing was bigger than life back then. And to do that was mattered. I thought that was great. And um, I think Sylvester Stallone, too. I still think he's one of the most interesting guys. I think The Rock, to interview him again would be great. The guy I want to interview uh, would be Seinfeld. My first job was for his dad. He's from Massapequa. He's about 12 years older than me. Uh, we have a lot of uh, some some people. Have, I've interviewed so many people that are friends with him. Um, I have not yet met him, and I'd love that's a, that's the a one guy I'd like to to interview. But I mean, interviewing George Bush forty three, I think he's one of the most underrated presidents and people around. And you talk about a Christian, uh, Tim. I don't care if you agree with him or not. And this guy is a believer. Number one and number two is just a really good person. And I think even Barack Obama said when he opened up his library, says, you might disagree with George Bush, but it's impossible not to like him. And why is that? Not that he's a perfect person, but he recognized he wasn't perfect. He was a crazy guy in his 20s, got a DWI and didn't listen to his dad and was drinking too much, period. Changed his life, got all this power. And the more power he got, the more kind, the kinder he got. And I've talked to more people that, uh, from Dana Perino on down that said still out of everyone they meet and work for, they'll never meet someone as admirable and personable as George W. Bush. Also, guess who one of his best friends is? Bill Clinton. 
And guess who 41? Guess who Bill Clinton looked up to? Bush 41. Guess who beat uh, Bush 41? Bill Clinton. So, I mean, it's there, percolating below. But to hear, see these great men talk, you know, these accomplished men, uh, and his dad was unbelievable uh, as a person, lived up to the hype. I found him unbelievably interesting, too. So those people really stand out to me. A hundred years from now, when your great grandkids are talking about their heritage, what do you want them to remember about you? Uh, number one, you just said, you know, you could be outplayed, you could be outscored, and you can lose, but just don't be outworked. That's the only thing, because you can control effort. You can't control outcomes. And I remember Jim Brown kind of screwed me up when he said, if you, you know, and so did Bill Parcells, No Medals for Trying. He wrote that book. And Jim Brown's like, you know, there's always more effort you could have done. There's always something else you could do. If someone says you got to take one more step and to save your life, you would find a way to do it. That's the way you should play. I get it. But on the same time, there's sometimes you do everything possible and it doesn't come out right. Whether it's the girl, the college, the game, job, and you could sit there and beat up on yourself nonstop. Or you could just say, I'm going to give it my all and let the chips fall where they may. And my glory is going to be delayed, not denied. Yeah, that's awesome. Brian, I know we're, uh, I know we're running out of time here. you got a, a tight schedule. Let me ask you a question. We, our goal here with this podcast is to kind of um, give people stories, hear more about them directly. Who right. is somebody that you know that has a great story that you think people should hear from or people would want to hear from? Hmm. Here's an unsung story that you're probably going to hear. Uh, Chris Bevilacqua. Chris Bevilacqua was a Penn State wrestler. His dad was a legend. Uh, he was the legendary gym coach, great coach. Chris went out and uh, bought two, uh, starred and bought two said TV networks, College Sports Network and the Classic Sports Network, and now is one of the premier sports executives around. Only people in the business know him, but if you ever talk to him, the most interesting, smartest guy who has that winner athlete mentality that you guys all have. Hmm, that's a good one. Yeah. I'd be interested. I got to look him up. And Brian, uh, I, I, I wrote down this question. I can't let you get off. The, you kind of already. Real quick, I gotta, I gotta hop on. Real, so. real quick. If you, if you had to vote for a Democrat in the, in, in the election, who would you vote for? Who would you write in? Uh, Harold Ford. Har Harold Ford. He's a commentator. Uh, he's a commentator on the show. Uh, on the, on the five. And you see him all over the channel. If he was running for president, sorry, Donald Trump, you'll be my runner. -up. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Brian. Brian Kilmeade, it is always such a pleasure. Uh, thank you again, my friend. I hope your family's doing great. Yeah, everybody's doing good, and I'll see you next week. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Bye, Bye guys. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, nothing left unsaid. For more on Barclay Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern US, Washington DC, and Toronto, go to barclaydamon.com. I wanna thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you liked today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you wanna make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.